Well, uh, good afternoon to everybody. It's my great pleasure and honor to chair together with Shlomo Winker this afternoon session, which is dedicated to the World Obesity Day that will take place, as you well know, well know uh, Saturday, March the 4th. Um, and it is a real great pleasure uh, on behalf of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes to uh, have organized uh, together with Wonka um, uh, this, this, this afternoon uh, meeting that, that, that uh, I'm sure will be very, very uh, interesting. Um, we will have a, uh, a patient representation. We will have a um, EASO um, um, yeah, representer and, and also a Wonka representer. So I pass now the chair to, uh, to Zlomo Winker uh, and he, he will introduce uh, with, uh, with some more word this, this, this afternoon uh, session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depends on the time zone you are in my country now it's already evening. And on uh, behalf of uh, Wonka Europe, the Association of Family Doctors of European Region, I am happy to be here with you for the second time. We had such a meeting last year. And uh, in this educational webinar, joint production of Wonka and ISO. In our last council meeting, uh, just last summer in London, we founded the, the European Special Interest Group of Family Doctors on Lifestyle Medicine, and Ozden is their representative here, and we will hear later. So we think that obesity and lifestyle medicine are very important parts of the framework of uh, family medicine. Obesity is a disease as it follows the pathways of a chronic disease. It doesn't mean that the only solution is in the medical or healthcare fields. It is a matter of public education, taxes, industry involvement, and many, many other uh, partners. But our contribution as family doctors, as a part of the healthcare community, had been extended significantly with the introduction. And I can say, not to be so dramatic for the first time, of effective uh, pharmacological interventions. This is the new player in the arena and we cannot ignore it. There are pros, there are cons, and it should be a part of the full scope of obesity management. I think that this is the reason that we will discuss the new approach in the light of the new medications. Family physicians have now a broad portfolio of tools, lifestyle and behavioral interventions, offering bariatric surgery, and of course, as I said, the medications to fight obesity become something that is reachable. So after these short words, I want to introduce Susie, which is Susie Birney from the European Coalition of People Living with Obesity about, and she will tell us about the patient's journey. Susie, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, quite often when I'm talking, I try and represent, I suppose, other people living with obesity. We, we try and share our stories collectively, but tonight I think I'm going to have to, for the time, just sort of focus on my own story and and um, share that. And uh, we can you can ask me any questions at the end. I'm open to any questions. So I'm living in Dublin. I'm in Ireland. Um, I was very fit and active as a young a youngster, but it was obvious from when I was young that I had an eating disorder. It's avoidance restrictive food intake disorder. Um, which is restrictive in nature that I have never eaten vegetables or fruit and it's quite complex but it was a battle from the beginning at mealtimes with my parents and I think that really began the feelings of not feeling normal not feeling like other people and not feeling like I, I fit into the, the normal society um, but following on from that into my teens I, I had a knee injury and then into depression in my my early 20s and I collectively think all of these played a part in the start of my my uh, journey into um, trying to manage my weight. I lost and I regained uh, weight more times than I can count. And we're talking about a vast amount, you know, uh, 20, 30 kilos at a time and then regaining more. Um, always focusing on the fix on my food disorder. I honestly believed that if I could fix my food disorder, everything would be fine. And that was the only problem that I had. 
I was physically very fit. I played a lot of sports. I nearly became a black belt in karate. I swam competitively. I was playing tennis and cycled everywhere. Um, I got to about 155 kilos um, and with no high blood pressure, no high cholesterol. Um, my weight was not impacting on my life physically. And I was very fit and active and, and able to function on a daily basis. But then in 2009, it suddenly changed quickly. Um, and that sudden change saw so in the one year I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Now, I had polycystic ovarian syndrome. I had an umbilical hernia and I had severe sciatica. And I still had my knee pain and depression and the other barriers that I had. So life drastically disimproved and my quality of life really disimproved. And I was referred to the weight management service in Dublin. I was also referred for my diabetes, but there was no connection. I went to one hospital for one on one side of Dublin city and I went to another for, for the diabetes and for the weight management one side, diabetes the other side, and in the city centre for my polycystic ovarian syndrome. So none of them were connected. And I didn't know there was a connection. I didn't know that any of them were um, connected about my weight. I, I had no idea. All I ever focused on was just my weight. So I had all these separate appointments um, and that started into then my treatments. So really, I suppose when I think of treatments over, over my lifetime so far, there was my self-treatments first. And that was years of slimming groups, years of, of trying. I had cognitive behavioral therapy. I tried neuro-linguistic therapy. As I said, fully fixated on, on fixing my food disorder. But really, I, th I think assumptions is a word that I come back to a lot when I think of, of, of what goes on with weight management and from my side and from the healthcare provider side. And I really think that people assume that we are not trying and they don't know the barriers that we face when we live with obesity. And I'm going to share one story, which I think kind of sums it up for me in, in that it was barriers in many senses that I faced in one given day. Um, I had an appointment at our local hospital and I'd had trouble with, I was waking up in, in the nighttime quite, quite often uh, to go to the toilet. So I was having a scan done and my car broke down that morning. So I had to go and get a bus. Now I'm weighing 155 kilos at this point and getting on public transport is quite difficult. Um, you, get on the, you sit on the seat and people won't sit beside you or they won't get out of the way for you to get off the bus. And in this hospital in Dublin, there's about, I suppose, nearly half a mile walk up to, from, the, from the gate, from the main road into the hospital, which was quite hard when you have pain and you've got swollen legs. So I get up to the department in the hospital and the nurses, um, uh, she asked me to, to, to do a sample and I couldn't fit into the cubicle. I could go into the cubicle, but I couldn't close the door. So I had to walk back down the corridor to find a wheelchair accessible toilet to, to do the sample. Came back up to her and she's really irate at this stage because I'm holding her up and there's no cuff that will take my blood pressure that fits. So they had to wait for that. She comes back and I'm going to do the test. And she says to me, oh, you didn't you didn't follow the instructions. You were told to fast from eight o'clock last night. And I said, well, I did. I, I fasted actually from 6 p.m. And she said, no, you couldn't have. You're non-compliant. You're just you're just one of these type of people. Look, you're too fat. I can't do this test. Just go home. You'll have to come back. And I'm thinking, how can I just come back? How can I lose this weight this quickly? I was so embarrassed, so shocked. I remember her face to this day. And I think I was only about 21 or 22 years of age at the time. And I remember the faces of all the rest of the staff in that ward that they were shocked too. And why I'm sharing the story is, is that I never went back. When she said, you, you have to come back another time, I didn't. I didn't speak to anybody about it. I left the hospital and I had to do the return journey on the bus with the load of school kids were just finished. I, I missed my stop because I couldn't get off the bus on time. And I got home and I was so broken, literally broken. I didn't get dressed for two or three days. And that was a day of just constant barriers that my weight physically, emotionally with stigma just prevented me from seeking follow-up care for that appointment. Now I was lucky that nothing was wrong in that case. So I was referred to the weight management service and the multidisciplinary team to me is just vital. It didn't work for me immediately. And again, back to these assumptions, I thought the fix was all about my food disorder and I focused on the psychology when really actually it was the whole team approach that worked. Um, I didn't understand what self-stigma was. I really didn't. Or the stigma from family that played a part in my life. Um, that look that you see from the person on the street the, the derision, the, the way they do a double take and look back at you and sneer. I didn't care what that person thought. People would say, why care what a stranger thinks? It was a reflection of what I thought of myself. And that was a very hard thing to face was that I actually hated myself at one point because I blamed myself for my weight that I couldn't fix myself. 
my mother would often say to me, I can't sleep at night. I'm worried sick, you're going to die. I felt so helpless. I felt so sick. I was putting her through this worry, but I couldn't wake up pinned tomorrow. What can I do with that? So I didn't believe surgery was a fix for me at the start uh, when I was at the weight management service. Um, I thought, you know, nobody decides on, on surgery lightly. And I really didn't think it was going to fix my food disorder. So I wasn't signed up for that at the start until my diabetes got out of control. I was on three medications and my readings were coming in under seven in old money. Um, and I still got diagnosed with retinopathy. Um, so I it was strongly suggested to me that I needed bariatric surgery to help with my type 2 diabetes. So I went to my private health insurance and I asked them, could they cover me? And they told me at the time that we can only cover you for half of this. But I had been out of work with the umbilical hernia. I wasn't able to maintain my lifestyle the way it was. I couldn't, I hadn't got the money to pay for it. That was when I started advocating for myself. So I argued with them that my health was deteriorating rapidly. And I think I was one of the first in our country that they paid for my surgery in full. And I had my bariatric surgery in July, 2015. In July, 2015, my diabetes reversed on the day. My retinopathy reversed and my quality of life Im improved immensely. I mean, I don't think I can even put it into words, the difference that that made for my life, having the worry of the diabetes gone. And then the weight loss was the last factor that was like the added bonus. So in the support groups that I joined when I was in the weight management service from 2009, Words we read quite a lot are the weight has gone forever. And that has to be the biggest assumption of all that people make. I, th I think that is something that people assume it's an easy fix. I knew I had to change something after bariatric surgery. It doesn't work by itself. You've got to work with it. And for me, with my food disorder, bread was something that I ate every day. And it's ironic, I think, that for reaching a level of severe obesity, I had a disinterest in food. So I would just eat bread sandwiches all day. So after my surgery, I stopped eating bread. And to this day, it has been 2,801 days I have not touched a slice of bread. And why am I bringing this up? I think it's because people assume, and back to our assumptions, that people living with obesity have no willpower, that we don't have what it takes to stick with what we're told, the diet plans and, and everything else. Well, I've gone 2,801 days without eating bread. I've sat on a plane when there was nothing else on offer but sandwiches and haven't had it. I've been at conferences when there's only sandwiches and I haven't eaten bread. I've woken up from a procedure and the first thing they offer you is tea and toast. And I've said no. And I tell you that takes willpower when it's the only food that I really would eat. That takes a lot of willpower. So I think when people assume that we don't have willpower, that's that's not right. Right now, just think of somebody in your life. I want you to think of somebody in your life who lives with obesity, whether that's a colleague, a friend, a family member. And just think of them right now and think now, do they have no willpower? Do you think they have less IQ than anybody else? And most importantly, do you think they're less deserving of treatment? Now think of somebody in your life who doesn't live with excess weight. Do you know by looking at them what their diabetes levels are? Do you know how bad their fibromyalgia is today? Do you know what their PSA levels are? We don't assume what anybody else's health status is, but we do for people who live with excess weight. You cannot assume anything looking at a person. I have eaten less. I have moved more. Unfortunately, of the 13 stone, which is 80 kilos that I lost post-bariatric surgery, I regained half of that. And looking at it, why did I regain half of that? Well, one of the reasons was that I couldn't maintain going to the gym from half six every morning to half nine. Every single day I went for about two years. Every day I, I walked six kilometers and I got to, it took a while to get up to that point because originally I couldn't walk with swollen legs and the weight I, I held. And in one of our support groups, every night we have a post that says, how are you moving today? Not even how many steps, but how are you moving? And one guy used to come on saying, I've walked six kilometers, I've walked six kilometers. And that was my goal was to be like him, that I would come on some night and say, I walked six kilometers. And on the very day that I walked six kilometers, he came on and he said, I've walked eight kilometers today. <laughs> I just laughed and I thought, why am I fixated on these numbers? But I was walking that amount every day and I couldn't sustain that. I couldn't sustain the obsession with numbers. I was watching the scales. I was weighing my food. I was monitoring everything. And I never, never got to the normal BMI. 
I was 26.9 at my lowest weight after losing 80 kilos, but I never got to a normal BMI. If you don't reach normal, what are you? You tend to feel abnormal. Regain feels worse. Self-stigma is 10 times worse. So it took me too long to ask again for help. I thought it was my fault. I didn't think there was any treatment left for me because so many times we hear bariatric surgery is the gold standard. So I misunderstood that, that that was it. I was done. I had tried everything. But now, luckily, I did ask for help and I am using pharmacotherapy. People assume, back to our assumptions, that if you are on pharmacotherapy after surgery, that your sur surgery has failed. And that's not true. On any given day when I'm eating, I can feel the restriction still seven years later from food that I'm eating. But the pharmacotherapy works in that I have to watch the clock and say, it's four hours since you've eaten. You're not hungry, but you need to eat now. And that takes away the constant thoughts of food, the constant thoughts of what am I eating next? When am I eating next? Am I hungry? Is it head hunger? Is it physical hunger? And that's what that does for me. And I am now maintaining both from the benefit of bariatric surgery and pharmacotherapy. I've lost again half of the weight I've regained. And, but really, when people will assume, back to our assumptions, when they look at me, they will see by my body size that I look like somebody who needs to lose weight. I'm lucky. I still have a team. I have a team that's looking after me. I have taken responsibility, but I still will always need that professional help. I think there's an analogy that I, I share, and it's probably very fitting because swimming is my passion. But if you imagine when a child is learning to swim and they begin in the shallow part and they have armbands on to help them with the aid and they have a swimming teacher there instructing them on what to do. And then as they improve, they move deeper into the pool and then they take off their armbands and they don't have that guide anymore. And then all of a sudden the lifeguard is gone and it's like you're being told to go out into the Atlantic Ocean and swim by yourself with nobody watching you. That's what a patient feels like after they've been given a treatment but have no help and no follow up after that care. So now I advocate for myself. Uh, how do I do that? I do that through peer support. Uh, our support meetings, we have meetings every week on Zoom. We meet face to face. We arrange family walks. We do help ourselves contrary to what most of society believes. I also advocate for myself through advocacy. I'm uh, the secretary for the European Coalition for People Living with Obesity, work that I'm really proud to be involved with, with a fantastic team of patient advocates across Europe. And then through that, I learned and, and got the, the confidence and I suppose some of the skills and I'm still, I still have a lot to learn to lead the Irish Coalition for People Living with Obesity where we also have a fantastic team of advocates who are trying to raise awareness about this chronic disease from the lived experience. How can we improve care? Well, from my own opinion, and I'm only here speaking for myself tonight, I think we have to stop the silos. We have to have better communication that it shouldn't be that a patient will go for the weight management one service and their diabetes in another and that none of it is connected. I also think that you need to treat the person in front of you as a complete individual. I've often been at an appointment and as soon as I say type 2 diabetes, I see the head go down and ticking a box and it's like, oh, I know now what, what Susie needs. No, you've never treated Susie Bernie before. I have other things to tell you about my health that might make a decision on what you decide on treating me. Don't assume patients are non-compliant. Remember their barriers and the barriers are physical. They can be mental. They can be socioeconomic. They can be all of that together. It can be genetics. And quite often, we don't know what those barriers are ourselves. So when you think a patient isn't turning up or they just haven't bothered to turn up for an appointment, just think of those barriers and ask why. Don't focus on the numbers. Don't focus on BMI on its own. We have a patient in our group, uh, Willie Mates. He was a captain of the ships and he was working and he broke every bone in his body and he was in extreme pain. And I'm going to just skim through this really fast. And he ended up on kidney dialysis. He was weighing 187 kilos and he was told he couldn't have a transplant until he got down to a certain weight. He was waiting on bariatric surgery, but his private health care in that hospital didn't have the facilities for somebody who needed bariatric care and who needed dialysis. So he waited about five or six years in the public system, doing his best in a wheelchair, in chronic pain, on dialysis three days a week. He had his surgery and he got down to 98 kilos and he was still refused a transplant because he wasn't 94 kilos. He wasn't the right BMI. Willie died last year in February. It's his anniversary. It's his anniversary. 
which I haven't forgotten. We haven't mentioned it in the groups, but he used to share his story with the students to help raise awareness for stigma. And I hope, I hope that people see beyond the number and don't take BMI on its own. Mind your words, we're not suffering, we're not battling, we're not obese people. You don't say to somebody, have you not tried? Did you not know? It's, have you tried? Did you know? Engage with the person, don't use negative talk. We don't suffer this. We adapt, we manage, we cope, and you treat together. Include us at every conversation. Let us sit at the table, it's an equal partnership. Ask our permission and ask, can we work together? This is a two-way street. We are just as important with our experiences as the signs. Let's hear the facts, but also hear the feelings because together we are a powerful force. It's not easy to share my story here, um, but you can only treat us if you know the reality of what it's like to live with obesity. Thank you for listening to me. So thank you, Susie, very, very much. I think it's extremely important in any session devoted to discuss the management of obesity uh, to have a, a witness that remember us, what is the wrong journey, journey and what could be a more helpful journey. So really, thank you, thank you very much indeed. And uh, well, uh, there are no Q and A so far. Uh, I'm sure that at the end we may uh, uh, rewrap uh, all the presentation. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, and actually he needs no presentation, Draw Dicker who is uh, part, is an officer of the ESO, is a co-coordinator of the Obesity Management Task Force. And uh, I don't see actually um, Dror, but probably is back on stage. And, um, and he will talk about uh, obesity management uh, and, 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 and he'll try to synthesize in 20 minutes or so uh, the many uh, the many new tools that we have right now. And so, draw the stage is yours. Thanks, Paolo. We have a pre-recorded presentation from Drawer, so I will share the presentation right now. Hello, my friend, and thank you for inviting me for this very important um, webinar for the um, Obesity Day and the cooperation of IASA and Wonka. So my talk today will focus on the goals and benefits of effective obesity management, and I don't have any conflict of interest regarding this uh, presentation. So weight loss targets. So we have three targets in uh, weight loss. The first one, of course, is weight loss. And today we are aiming uh, for 15% weight loss. The third target is to really prevent and treat diabetes uh, obesity complication. So we see from this um, very large study that if you reduce 15% uh, your uh, body weight, you can really very effectively prevent from um, developing diabetes much more than if you lose just 7%. The same with hypertension. So 15% is the current target for really preventing diabetes and preventing other disease. So in the past, we uh, aimed for five to 10% weight loss Today, we are aiming for 10 to 15%, really in order to really accomplish much more um, better prevention and treatment of other diseases like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and have path. Very interesting, um, if you're asking people with obesity, what is their goal for weight loss? So in the action IO, they really declare 16% is their goal. 
And when you ask healthcare providers what is their uh, perception of the goal of weight loss, they uh, really declare that 17% is their uh, goal. So I think 15% is really the right target um, also in the eyes of people with obesity and healthcare providers. So what are the new uh, medication in the horizon? So Lee Kaplan put this on this uh, very nice um, presentation. And he showed us that between intensive lifestyle therapy and bariatric surgery, we had in the past the first anti-obesity medication that was FENFEN. And then the second generation include naltroxone bupropion, fentramine topiramate, and iraglutide 3.0 milligram that we are using today in um, various countries around the world. But now we have the third generation that includes semaglutide 2.4 milligram. So in um, Tim Garvey paper, he really uh, tried to put the frame of the second or third generation of anti-obesity medication. So the first um, criteria is the ability to safely produce an average of 10% of placebo substructed weight loss in randomized clinical trials. And the second uh, criteria that uh, the, the drug should uh, really produce a 15% weight loss uh, over in half of the patients of the study. So you can have the first one or the second one, and this uh, uh, will define if you are fulfilling the criteria of third generation anti-obesity medication. So if you look on the uh, semaglutide 2.4 milligram, you can clearly see that the weight loss, uh, when you compare the drug to the placebo, it's much more the 10% difference between the drug and placebo. So this criteria is fulfilled. The second criteria is that at least 50% will lose more than 50% weight loss. So again, we can see here that more than 50% of patients lost 15% of their body weight. So semaglutide 2.4 milligram can really define third generation anti-obesity medication according to this paper. So what is semaglutide 2.4 milligram? Semaglutide is a um, GLP-1 human analog that has 94% homology to the human GLP-1. The T half is approximately one week. And we can see the difference uh, in the uh, amino acids to the human GLP-1. Now, semaglutide 2.4 milligram leads to uh, reduce appetite, reduce energy intake, reduce body weight, and really uh, affect other metabolic cardiovascular risk factors. In the animal um, or in the mouse brain, we can see that uh, semaglutide directly activate the area of uh, area postrama and nucleus auditoris tract, and also direct activation of the hypothalamus. As we can see here in these uh, very beautiful um, videos, if you inject semaglutide, you really affect the hindbrain, nucleus auditoris tract, and the hypothalamus. But indirectly, you can really see that there is activation of the parabrachial nucleus and other uh, centers in the amygdala. So we assume that there is direct effect on the hedonic signals in the nucleus auditory tract and uh, in the hypothalamus, there is um, hemostatic signals, effect on the hemostatic signals, but there is indirect effect on the parabrachian nucleus that really leads to meal termination. So there is a direct effect and indirect effect of semaglutide on the brain. And this leads to these uh, uh, studies that showed us that using semaglutide 2.4 milligram can lead to reduction in energy intake 
by 1,577 kilojoule compared to only more than 600 kilojoule in the placebo. And in this study, they showed us that using semaglutide 2.4 milligram um, increased the uh, um, fullness and satiety and also overall appetite uh, suppressor score and reduced in hunger and um, prospective food consumption. So there was really a central effect of uh, semaglutide on these indices. But they also showed us in another study that the effect of uh, gastric emptying was uh, like the placebo. So no effect on gastric emptying. So to summarize this part is that semaglutide really affects on uh, hunger and satiety directly and indirectly centrally in the brain. Now, the phase three program of semaglutide um, is very vast. And you can see here that the dose escalation between 0.25 to 2.4 milligram in combination of lifestyle changes. And this program of the step showed a very remarkable weight loss, around 15% weight loss nearly in all the studies. And more in uh, if we want to see how uh, much um, was the effect, we can see that more than 50% really lost 15% of their weight. And 15% weight loss was very impressive in all the studies. A very interesting study that was very uh, published very recently is the step five. In the step five, they compare semaglutide 2.4 milligram to placebo for two years. And this is the longest study with semaglutide 2.4 milligram. Now, we can clearly see that there was a very remarkable 15% weight loss, but the weight loss was maintained for two years as long as the medication was taken. This shows us that the effect is maintained and sustainable. Now, what was what were the um, side effects? Mainly gastrointestinal and gallbladder related disorders. And if we look on the uh, side effects, and this is very important for day-to-day uh, -day treatment of those patients, we can see that the nausea is the most um, advanced or most popular um, side effect, but it lasts between six to eight days and it subsides along the time there is diarrhea vomiting and constipation and constipation is the longest side effect that was described so we can really understand those patients that come with us come to us and and complain on constipation and we can help them by encouraging them to drink more water uh, and to use more fiber in their food. Now, the second uh, generation, th third generation uh, anti obesity medication is tirzepatide. Now, we know that uh, nutrient load that moves in the uh, intestine can really lead to secretion of GLP 1 from the L cells and GIP from the K cells that leads to insulin secretion. Now we know that GLP-1 is reducing food intake, like GIP, and reducing body weight, like GIP effect. But GLP-1 increasing nausea, in contrast, GIP reducing nausea. GLP-1 increasing insulin secretion as GIP, but GLP-1 decreased glucagon secretion in contrast to GIP that increase glucagon secretion from alpha cells. And GLP-1 also reduce gastric emptying um, and GIP does not have effect on gastric emptying. So there is a logic to combine these two hormones in one molecular 
and this molecular is tirzepatide. So tirzepatide is a 39 amino acids linear peptide. Uh, the T half is five days. And the plasma concentration in people with renal and hepatic impairment do not differ versus healthy people. You can see here that tirzepatide really activates the GIP receptor and also the GLP receptor. Now, again, there is a very vast program, this uh, suppressed program in type 2 diabetes patient because it was aimed to treat diabetic patient. But um, as we can see a very, very favorable side effect of this uh, uh, anti-diabetic uh, um, medication that it was very remarkable uh, weight loss. So combined GLP-1 and GIP in type 2 diabetic patient lead to very impressive weight loss. Again, if you look in these type 2 diabetic patient, the 15% weight loss, we can see here the 27% on placebo reach 15% weight loss. That's why um, there was and there is still studies that use those uh, this medication, trisepatide, in obese patient without type 2 diabetes. Without type 2 diabetes. So the first one that was um, really published is Sermont 1, and they showed us remarkable weight loss in non-type 2 diabetic obese patient. We can see here 22% weight loss after one year of treatment. Excellent results. Again, if we look on the categorical weight loss, you can see that more than 50%, 50 to 60% of the uh, patient, the obese patients uh, lost 20%, not just 15, 20% of the baseline weight. Now, the third target, which is really the second target, is maintaining weight loss. And for my humble opinion, this is the most important target, because if you want to reach from the first target to the third target, you have to go through maintaining weight loss. And this is the most difficult task. Why it's so difficult? Because when you're losing weight, your hunger is rising because the satiety hormone is decreasing and the hunger hormone is increasing. So you have less GLP-1 and less PYY and you have high uh, level of ghrelin and you become more hungry. And there is reduction in energy expenditure because you have less activation of the sympathetic activity, less leptin, and much more energy efficiency in your metabolism. So the net effect is um, gaining the weight loss back. So you're more hungry, you're less, uh, um, you're reducing your energy expenditure, and you're gaining weight. Now, is it dangerous? Is it harmful to gain weight after you're losing weight? So we did this study and we um, really measure four trajectories. The first one is stable thir BMI 30. The second one is increasing slowly weight above BMI 40 and increasing and reducing weight and reducing and increasing weight. When we compare the three to the stable BMI of 30, we clearly see that all the trajectory increased total mortality by 50%, meaning variability of weight is harmful. So there is a need to maintain weight loss and not reduce, main, reduce weight and then regain weight. And if we could uh, go back to the scale IBT study with reraglutide, when they compare um, IBT, you can see here what is IBT, intensive behavioral treatment, 
to IBT and liraglutide, and IBT, liraglutide, and multi-component or meal replacement diet. In the end of the year, the IBT and liraglutide was much better than just IBT. But what was important is the sub-study of this study, when they showed us a comparison of hunger and craving in these three arms. And what they showed us that after 28 weeks, there was no difference uh, in craving or hunger. Now let's do an exercise. Let's put the graph of the weight loss on this craving and hunger. And what we can clearly see, and very interesting, see that when the difference on craving or hunger is subside, the weight loss is stopped. And now there is a new phase. Even though there is no difference between the arms for craving, there's still difference in weight here and here. Meaning that there is two phases of the medication. The first phase is weight loss, but the second phase of the medication is weight maintenance. Even though there is the, the effect on craving or hunger or food perception is no difference for uh, um, liraglutide plus IBT to just IBT, there is, is still difference in the weight. And if we look at the same study with semaglutide, hunger and fullness, of course, we can see there is a very impressive reduction in hunger and increasing in fullness until the week of 52, when we will put the graph of weight loss, we see the same trend, meaning in semaglutide, we postpone the um, plateau to one year, and then there is maintenance of the weight loss, meaning even though there is no difference in hunger or fullness, still the drug works. So when the patients come to you and say, look, I don't feel the drug work anymore because they don't feel they are losing weight anymore, this is a mistake. The, dr the drug is working and now the task is to maintain the weight loss. And we can clearly see that the drug is maintaining the weight loss now if again if we see the results of craving positive mood craving for sovereign craving for sweets according to week 20 week 52 and week 104 meaning two years you can see that still the craving is um favorable under the use of semaglutide 2.4 milligram there is favorable effect on craving for savory but after two years there is no difference on craving of sweets so there is subside effect the effect is subside after two years regarding craving for sweet and maybe this leads to um subside effect of mood Still, we have to really explain our um, patients that the effect is still ongoing regarding weight maintenance. Now, why, why is it? Why even though that the effect on fullness and craving is subsiding, still the weight loss is maintaining? Maybe one explanation comes from this study when they compare in animal uh, that were treated with semaglutide and animals that were, were treated with weight match diet, both lost the same weight. But if you look on the energy expenditure, using semaglutide blunts the metabolic ad adaptation and the um, energy expenditure that was lost and was reduced in the diet treated uh, mouse was not affected by the semaglutide treated mouse, meaning the semaglutide prevented the metabolic adaptation. We can see here a very uh, recent publication in the Obesity Week in a very similar study. Now they used semaglutide 1 milligram uh, and trisepatide 15 milligram. 
again, <clears throat> the weight loss was the same, but when you compare using GLP-1 plus GLP-1 and GIP, trizeptide and semaglutide, both prevented the decrease of energy expenditure, meaning they prevented the metabolic adaptation, and maybe this really maintained, helped to maintain the weight loss after the plateau uh, was reached. And to the end, a very uh, recent publication in the Obesity Week, when in human, they compare in type 2 diabetic patients, trizepatide 15 milligram to semaglutide 1 milligram, and to placebo, of course, this is the lower amount of semaglutide, they showed us that the weight loss or the energy intake was the same with trizepatide and semaglutide compared to placebo. They were both very effective in reducing energy intake in human, but there was difference in the weight loss. Trizepatide 15 milligram was better than um, semaglutide 1 milligram. Again, it's in type 2 diabetes. So the comparison in non-type 2 diabetes should be with semaglutide 2.4 milligram, but now in diabetic patient is one milligram because this is the dosage for type 2 diabetes patients. So there was better um, weight loss with trizepatide, but what was very interesting, even though there, there was difference in weight loss, the effect on fasting, <clears throat> satiety, fullness was the same. Meaning if you look on these results in human, maybe there is an, a, a level that those medication does not affect more if you increase the effect on the brain, on these indices. So my take home message is, <clears throat> what I called TMT, treat and maintain the target. So the target for weight loss should be 15% using second generation or third generation anti-obesity medication with lifestyle med um, management. We need 18% weight loss to really affect and uh, reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, 15% for cardiovascular morbidity and mortality maybe is not enough, we need eight, at least 18% weight loss. Weight variability can lead to increased risk for morbidity and mortality. Weight loss maintenance is a challenging and important target in obesity management. Hence, we should use the term treat and maintain the target. And holistic weight management and the third generation anti-obesity medication can treat and maintain the target of weight management. And by saying so, I really want to thank you for your listening and congratulate you for the World Obesity Day. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Um, Lisa, we have three um, questions. Do you think we should manage them later? Yes, yes. Sure. I think we should possibly save all the Q&A questions for the last half an hour. Obviously, Drawer um, submitted a pre-recorded presentation. And so if you have any questions, hopefully some of the chairs or the other speakers would be able to answer. So thanks for your questions and we'll um, keep them for the last half an hour of the session. So I'll hand over to Shlomo for now. Okay, so now we are going to our third lecture. lecture. We are on a little bit confused on time because there is a lag. We planned, I presume, another lecture that uh, went down at the end. So I would like to introduce our last speaker, Ozden Kog, Kog Demir. Yes, I practiced a lot. She's the family doctor from Izmir Medical School, and she will talk about weight loss maintenance. You know, it's just a really continuum to the presentation by Dr. Dol Dicker. Uh, that the stage is yours. Thank you very much. It is very, it is a pleasure for me and honor for me to be here uh, and to be with you on this very important day. I do hope that you can see my slides. 
Could yes, you? Yes, we can see the slides. Um, All right. And now we can great. see it full screen. Yeah, thank that's you. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I am here a part of Izmir University of Economics, but also I am the chair of Onco Working Party on Environment. And to all together, a part of Life Science Medicine Wonka, a special interest group too. So it is very important for us to just um, maintain these two, three uh, groups all together on this very important day. I just want to begin with my words with the Natalius. As you may say, as he, it is a growth of mathematics, although we are talking about not only numbers, but the numbers also shows us to evaluate, to assess where we are going through where we are now. Uh, this is a slide from our second year lectures for our medical students. As you may see, to understand the growth of a child, we should just get some phases. And it's begin with infancy to adolescence. And in here, uh, when we are talking about the growth or development, we can see the politics, heredity, and also in environment are affecting the growth of the child. And so we may say that when we are evaluating or assessing or doing anything, we should just see the child as a whole. If we are just so keen on or precisely doing the best things for our child in development, also we are doing to ourselves and also for our planet too. So in here for the second year uh, students, we are saying that for take on messages, do it as physiological, biochemical and also environmental. And they are just taking this to their focus and what's happened afterwards. It is just getting bigger and bigger and the obesity is getting bigger too. So where is the part it is not going right? As you may see, there is role models too. Maybe you are not obese. Maybe you are in the wrong cultural phase. Is it really true? So in here, lifestyle medicine begins a very important role because mental health is also affecting this uh, stigmatization and also the roles to phrase and the perspective for individuals. One of them is stress. How can you not be stressed in this wild world when you are just coming to the jungle? So it is the first proxy killer as the American Medical Association noted. And in here, we can understand that stress is not only affecting our headaches, it is not only a pain on our neck, but also it is affecting our eating behaviors. Like what? For example, if we add exercise, maybe our brain and also our physical activity will be much more appropriate. Disease and heart attacks and also diabetes is and the, at the end so we can just face off in here we may say that poor nutrition it doesn't mean only to have, have you got a lot of money at your pocket it is about the thing about the nutrition you are taking so for the obesity we are using but maize index but is upper body obesity or abdominal obesity will affect our health too Yes, of course, that means we should change our tools if we are wanting to do the best for our patients. In here, I just want to remind you the poor sleep. Why? Because most of the time, while we are having lots of screen time, lots of electricity and so on, we are just losing appropriate, clean, hygienic sleep too. What will affect to our physical life? This is a case report, as you may see. You can say that uh, for the type 2 diabetes, transit ischemic attack could be seen because atrial fibrillation is also another factor that affects type 2 diabetes. If something is wrong, going wrong, if we don't figure out the root reasons, it will just uh, result with another, another disaster. So lifestyle medicine approach will be a real recipe for us. In here, we can see the sleep and diabetes. As you may see, when it's going uh, worse for the diabetes, and also it will just be bad for our sleep too. When they come together, 
it will make the things much more worse for our patients. So the best is not to have a sedentary life, not to have a poor diet, or just to know how to use caffeine and alcohol, or not to use. So physical activity and exercise could be a way of it as one of the no-bains of lifestyle medicine. And so we can implement diets for it. it. You don't need to have so much money for that. You don't need to be vegan or strictly vegan. And while we are implementing exercise, that means we should have some places, appropriate places to use it. If you don't have cycling areas in your cities, how can you make the cycling? So, so we can find another way to do the exercise. Because of this reason, environmental factors are very, uh, is affecting our life for the obesity too. If we are just keen on to just the growth of our child, also we should just talk about our environment, our planets and our cities. This was another picture uh, that happened in Turkey. It is the Syrian and Turkey border, you may remember. And I just want to mention that thank you all from all over the world just helped us in this very terrible um, situation and help us to survive. In here, you can just see the crackdown in the uh, places. Lots of the geologists says that if it is a living planet, earthquakes are just the things that we will have to face. Okay, but how can we manage like that? You have got equipment, but you're putting somewhere very wrongly. So this is not the management. It is the same to manage the obesity too. So we, we can talk about diets and we can use how to make it, not all of them also, part by part. Maybe mediation could be make it because when we are um, just free in our minds, that means the lifestyle will be much more appropriate for it because maybe resilience will be more strength. What about smoking sessions? Lots of the people are just putting things together. For example, when they are just keeping on smoking, that means the vascular system will be also very worse. And if they are obese, if they are just having COVID-19 and other diseases, the things will be much more worse. So we should just think about the circadian rhythm. What about COVID times? Does it change anything? Yes, of course, not only for our patients, but also for family physicians, all the healthcare workers, it changed lots of things. For example, the effective remote consultations have been changed. And uh, this is the latest uh, publication that we have made with the medical students and master's students. We have seen that COVID-19 has just made an anxiety and also affect the eating disorders in those people. These are the ones who are the solvers, who are not the ones just getting the root, root, root bad things, not the cause of them. They are the solvers of the bad things and the root reasons, but now they have got the problem. And also COVID-19 just showed us obesity is also a very bad factor, a risk factor for the people who have got these diseases and infectious diseases. For HIV, we may say that you can use condoms and not having sex and so on. But when we are just breathing, how can we say, just don't breath it. And obesity just making this breath much more worse. So in here, we need a behavioral change. How can we make it? The first is cognition, then emotion, and it just goes with the motivation. Yes, of course, but there are steps of it. In here, we may say that non-pharmacologic approaches like lifestyle medicine could save our cases, not only for the obesity, but also for the bread diabetes. In our uh, university, we have got the lifestyle medicine courses, but the truth is how can we make and use these tools? The first approach is butterfly technique. 
for example, for the low-income families. But why the children in here are overweight or obese? Or we can say, is it about exercise or is it about not having healthy diet? So when we look at the big picture, it is not only for the individuals, but it is on the stage of our community co communities too. So coping strategies will be another way to help us. So we should just know about the language we are using. Weight is a complex issue not only for our patients, also for healthcare workers too. We can't use stigmatization for our language and be alert and sensitive to cultural differences too. Yes, everybody knows, as Leonard Cohen says, there are bad things about obesity and if we just use these tools, we will be much more healthy. So why don't we use that so? Because when we are trying to get a program to do it, we are just staying on the Mondays, not going to the Tuesdays and Wednesdays. It's just going to be at the first stage. So let's look at our faces. In here, we can talk about SMART goals. SMART goals are the goals that could be done with ourselves, not the highest ones, but the ones that we can do step by step. In here for the physician, motivational interviewing will be a way of it. Reflections and summaries too. Never walk alone is an item that has been used for a sports team, a soccer team, I guess, but also for our patients too. Patient-centeredness is very important. So when we are just putting our patient on this chair, the patient shouldn't be alone. Family centeredness could be used at that time too. So the things has to be measurable. How much and how many could be the real estates to do it so we can go to the target position. In here, uh, there's a module that could be used. This is uh, uh, from Lilia Maleski, our chair on Wonka Lifestyle Medicine Special Interest Group. And these are the parts that could be used for our colleagues. They are most of the time free online courses. Let's talk about some cases. Let's take that. We have got a 60 years old female and has been uh, diagnosed with diabetes. And as you may see, body mass index is so high. When he is saying that, he is drinking, 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 and still be thirsty. For most of the colleagues, yes, it, it is normal because when you have got diabetes for all those years, when it is so uncontrolled, so we can talk about drinking so much the water and this is polydipsy. What can we do? What should uh, we ask for our patients? What about the medications? Has she got depression or other things? As you may see, polypharmacy is another thing that we should just face in primary care with our patients. These are the natural and normal uh, anamnesis forms that we are using. When we go to in details, we may say that there are lots of things that we can get for the lifestyle medicine history taking. And in here, we can use these things to approach. So what would we ask our patient? How can we learn from our patient? Maybe things that we have made also a way that could be used before, not the tools that he can, she can use. For example, uh, when she has got a bad ridden um, relative, how can we say that just go on swimming? We should find a way to use it. So it will be better to make a plan, not to have a one. At least we can handle them and trying to make the risk management. But the decision making should be made together on the both sides. So Mediterranean diet is also a very good tool that we can use. It is evidence-based. The other options are to be the not to use tobacco. So we can use this part for quitting smoking. 
and lead to some scannings and follow-ups. These are so scanning uh, is not a part of lifestyle medicine, it's prevention, but our patient is whole patient. We can just take that I am taking this part and not talking about the others. So these are my references. I have got another patient too, as you may see with hypertension. Most of the patients in primary care are not coming only for one reason. They maybe have got diabetes and also hypertension or anything else like that. And when they have come to our clinic, sometimes they are coming just to say hello. In COVID times, some of them were coming to our clinic's surgeries for taking health reports to go away. Again, the same things could happen. Again, we can use the lifestyle medicine approach for them. And in here, we can find out what could be done and what is she doing right now. And then we can just go on for regular checks for these patients. In here, you may see lots of patients, lots of uh, examples for that. The truth is, when we are trying to send our loves, our patients, our courage to our pa uh, patients, we should be just handling it all together. Because not only love uh, could ch choose it, but also the way we are using it. So for a patient like that, what could be the first thing to plan? For example, breast walking is an ideal way. You may remember this film, it just happened to talk so many times. How can you just make it for a patient like that? So we will just make it slowly, slowly, and afterwards we will just put on much more longer times for walking, for example. Does it work? Yes, but not only physical exercise, we can just talk about the diet too. Could it work? Yes, of course, but we need something more. And this is about how much weight we should just lose. Afterwards, we can just say that we can keep on our plan. I didn't want to use another um, person because it, you could find these things on uh, any other internet websites. He was like that, he just goes through, now he is like that. So it can be. What about our planet? Does it change anything? Yes, of course. We need only one minute for our planet. We are talking about diets and so on. If our planet isn't healthy, it won't be any way to get healthy diet to, for example, plant-based diet. Thank you very much for having me in this obese today. And I just want to remind you another thing. It is next skin you and it has got lifestyle medicine courses. It's free. These models could be used for everyone else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Osden. And now uh, I think that we finished our three lectures and now we are open the stage for uh, the Q and the A session. And it will be also okay if we will end a little bit earlier than planned. So uh, let's see um, the questions, yes. Yeah, sh sure. And uh, if drawer is not, uh, with us, uh, I, I, I can answer the, at least I can move up the discussion around the question that are in the Q&A. So the first question is GLP-1 receptor post leave in patient with autonomic neuropathy and gastropathy. Well, the answer is, is yes, both. There are uh, several experiences published and unpublished. Uh, on the use of uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, liraglutide, semaglutide, before surgery, in order to reduce as much as possible the weight before going to the procedure. And also uh, remember that surgeons do not like at all and patients uh, as well to redo surgery. And it has been shown, and Susie also reminded us, that uh, there is a good uh, place in therapy 
of GLP-1 receptor agonists post sleeve, in particular, but post uh, any kind of uh, 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 surgery, bariatric surgery. And, and we uh, know and also that a third of the patients that goes bariatric surgery are re going regain to weight. Regain weight. So there is there is a large uh, uh, there is a large amount of patients. And the second answer is yes. Um, it has been published with exenatide, uh, but I think we can enlarge to, to all GLP-1 receptor agonists that actually uh, the reduction in gastrointestinal motility that is typical with these drugs and is the reason why in the first weeks there is nausea and the other uh, gastrointestinal um, disturbances, uh, uh, do not take place in people with uh, autonomic gastropathy and neuropathy, uh, just because in fact, is, there are no D factor in place. And therefore there is no uh, contraindication. And actually in theory, these patients that already suffer from those um, symptoms do not, uh, should not have an increase in uh, in uh, in this uh, in this uh, side effects common side effects okay then the second question is related to sglt2 uh, inhibitor it, uh, it it is now well known that these drugs lead to a very very moderate weight loss and it has also been shown that if you calculate the the theoretical weight loss due to the amount of calories that are wasted due to glycolysis, the weight loss should be bigger. But in fact, there is a, a counter-regulatory uh, mechanism that lead to increased appetite. And therefore, uh, the, the net uh, weight loss is really very moderate. We all know that SGLT2 inhibitors have various very positive effect both on heart failure and, and uh, kidney failure. Uh, they certainly can synergistically act together with GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, so great, but I would not really consider SGLT2 inhibitor as important drugs for weight loss since their effect is around 4%. Three, four percent, and then um, there is a question related to the uh, coronary calcification disease risk with GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure that uh, the question is whether these drugs can lead to calcification. I would say, uh, what, how how can these drugs can act? Well, this is not known to the best of my knowledge. Uh, we know that all this cardiovascular outcome trial in type 2 diabetes, and we eagerly wait for the select results, EMA 2.4, in a population of high-risk obesity patients without diabetes. We know that this drug, I was saying, reduce the risk of having an event, uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction or stroke. And uh, uh, we don't have, I don't think we have data specifically on those who have more calcification uh, and, and I would rule out completely uh, the contrary that, that these drugs can lead to uh, an increased risk in this, in this uh, sense. Uh, then there is a sort of common, a, com a comment of course, SEMA, we, know, we know that, that, that there is a big of label use in countries, uh, that are all the countries except the United States where SEMA is available only at one milligram. And right now, if there is a, a, a big, big lack of this drug, even for diabetics, at, at least in Italy, but I think that more or less the situation is like this in many, many uh, countries. Uh, and, and, and the reason is, 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 is that no Nordisk is doing his best and actually probably as soon as um, SEMA 2.4 will be available in Europe, uh, uh, they should solve this problem. There is a big, big request. 
Uh, and at the moment, unfortunately, there is a shortage of these very effective drugs. And um, um, yes, in fact, in fact, Maria Teresa Acuto was saying exactly that. And I think that in Europe, the situation, I don't know in Israel, but I was talking with Dror and Dror was saying to me that the situation was very bad even, even in, uh, in, in, in Israel. And yes, I think all the all the all the European countries are, are facing this 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 shortage in Italy. It's terrible. They, I keep receiving message and telephone call from patients. Before uh, there were patients that that, that were using it off label. Now it's it's patient are patients with type two diabetes. Same situation in Serbia. Uh, so okay, that would be nice if. Um, well, with 100 uh, participants, I think it's impossible to have a, a live discussion altogether, but <laughs> if there is other, other question. And uh, probably just to break a bit the, the uh, not the ice, because I'm sure there is no ice, there is warm around this. Uh, uh, well, I would like to ask Susie, uh, what's your feeling when you, here presentation regarding the new drugs. What, how's your feeling considering all your story, okay. you know, your-, your... Um, Mixed feelings, <laughs> um, excitement that there are these treatments coming and that there, um, there are more options for patients, but frustration that they're not easily accessible. Um, I, I think that what we actually, what I would like to ask yourselves is that we read a lot of in the support groups, patients who are on medication and they say that they have different experiences. So some of them will say, I thought I was supposed to feel nauseous and I'm not. And at what point should patients know that they should stop taking a medication if it's not working? Because they don't necessarily tell their healthcare provider that it's not working because they don't want to be taken off it. So we see that quite a bit where some patients are saying, this isn't doing what I thought it was going to do. And we try and explain that everybody responds differently to different treatments, but we're coming as from the patient saying that we don't have the same sort of maybe power of their healthcare provider saying that. So what would you think? Well, uh, first of all, uh, it, depends, it, depends, uh, it depends from, from, from the drugs, from the, from the molecule. We are expecting uh, in Europe, you're expecting SEMA 2.4, but we know what is cooking. There is the association of SEMA 2.4 with Cagrilin Thai 2.4 that, that probably goes beyond 20%, closer to 30%. Then we have Tisepatide. We have listened to the draw presentation. And then the, there are the triple agonists and many other drugs. Uh, so I think that the advancement would be really, really important. Uh, but there is the problem of the fact that so far, for many reasons, first of all, because in many countries, uh, obesity is not accepted as a disease, but these drugs are not reimbursed. Mm -hmm. uh, I really hope that if, as I heard, the select trial will give positive result, at least the national uh, agency should reimburse at least for those persons with obesity that are at very high risk. But this probably could be a, a Troy horse in order to have this drug reimbursed. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, Susie, that uh, so far there is this situation in which a person with obesity obesity has expectations from certain treatment. And, and if this expectation is not fulfilled, then it's one, you know, an, another failure that has drawbacks. Uh, if the patient feels it's a failure and that's the problem from our side to try yes, and help support yes, them. Because yes, yes, because on, on top yeah. of the stigma and on all the, the things, they think maybe, oh, this is my fault again. It's not the drug that is not working. It's, it's the interaction with myself. So I really believe that. And then more... can I add, 
they go into their pharmacy to collect their medicine and they're told by the pharmacist, I'm sorry, but because of a shortage, we're going to hold this for our patients who have diabetes because they, yeah. they come ahead of you. And they walk yeah. out of there feeling even worse. I don't deserve this, according to my pharmacist. And yes. we're seeing this and we're dealing with this in the support groups then, the fallout where patients are feeling they're nearly pitting against each other. You yeah. know, when no one disease is worse than another, everybody deserves Absolutely, absolutely. This is terrible. This is really terrible. But y y you know, and, and, and there are many friends now that are listening to us. I think we are pushing hard and hard. You know, we had this, this meeting at the Ministry of Health yesterday in Italy, and, and there is in preparation a law. So the parliament will, will, will be faced to, to, to accept the law and, and, and the law will tell you have to do this and that. So, you know, things that things are moving. We have to, to really catch the, 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 the political um, uh, policies situation with the advancement together and hopefully. I want, I want also to have a comment uh, to you, Susie, and also to you, Osden. We are talking about failure. <clears throat> failure have a lot of also psychological implications. And also, uh, as we know, uh, if it's a disease or not a disease, obesity is a long journey. Actually, actually it's a lifelong uh, situation or disease. It doesn't matter the terminology. And the best contact, and you, you started your story about three different hospitals that are treating you in, for three different diseases, but that have the same root. The solution should be in the hands of qualified family doctors that are looking at the holistic, uh, the, the whole of the patient as a holistic point of view. So I would ask both of you, what do you think about this holistic approach in the long journey of patients with obesity? It's vital. It's absolutely vital. Um, I feel like I've had the benefit of some very, very understanding healthcare professionals in my life for different areas. But my own GP himself. Now, this was a few years ago, and I hope, I hope, I hope from listening to webinars like this that he now understands maybe better. But there was one day after my bariatric surgery where I was on that trajectory of regain. And he said, you know, hop on the scales there. And oh, oh, I see you're gaining. Um, so we chatted a little bit, but it was at the end of my consultation. So like always, there's not much time and his words aren't intentional, but he said, um, so he said something about my weight and I said, but sure, we know obesity is a chronic relapsing disease. And it was like, I slapped him. He said, oh no, oh no, that takes away personal responsibility. And I stopped and I said, you've referred me to all of the different things I have tried over the years in taking personal responsibility. When have I never taken personal responsibility it has to be both two ways we take responsibility but we need it to be recognized as a disease to get the proper professional help and the treatment that suited me when I was 35 years old I'm now 47 and facing menopause my treatment again will have to be tailored because my body is changing there is no one fix and I think unfortunately GPs feel they find a treatment for a patient that's it job done that should be sorted end of and it's not because it is a chronic relapsing is the word not used enough, relapsing disease. And um, so the holistic approach, I think, is vital. As I said, I put all my eggs in the basket of thinking I fix my food disorder and I'm fixed. It's not. It was so much I got from the psychology, physiotherapy. You know, it's it's it has to be a full rounded approach. I really, really honestly believe that. Thank you, and us dead from your point of thank view. Thank you, thank you very much. But uh, I totally agree because if you just cooperate to, together, if you just collaborate, uh, that means you are not a part. You, you are a team, and if you're a team, if something is going good, you two make together. If not, uh, you two again uh, for the primary care uh, level. But the truth is maybe you will just offer something to your patients. You just want to do good things for your patients. But have you got ability to do that? Have you got burden? Uh, most of the time in most of the countries like mine, uh, there are some burdens for the primary care physicians too. Everybody thinks that they have got something very uh, mystical uh, when they say or something. And there was an old uh, film, I guess, when the hero just uh, knuckled the nose, everything just uh, smashes down and it tickles down. But the truth is, yes, we would love to do something like that, but we can't. 
for example, in Turkey, we can just switch to the metformin or the other uh, drugs to the insulin as we want, although we have got the training for this because it is just not for the legacy. Uh, the um, officials of, of this payment wouldn't just pay for it. The patient should pay from the pocket. So they can do something like that, although they do know how to make it. Social prescribing is not a recipe for most of the countries, for most of the low-income countries. Maybe the family physician knows how to do this, and maybe the patient could do this, but they haven't got the opportunity. These are the things that maybe uh, over these two characters, but could be made all together. So uh, not only one uh, fit could be just fits your patient, but we can just tailor a new thing together. If we can, we will be successful for not only obviously for the other uh, burdens too. Okay, thank you both. And uh, I think that last sentence uh, I will give to you, Paolo, to summarize this excellent well, discussion. Thank you, thank you, Zlomo. I really thank uh, the speakers, both present and absent. And uh, I think we had a very nice late uh, afternoon in Italy and early morning, I don't know, somewhere else. Um, and uh, I think that we are really, you know, in a situation in which luckily enough, luckily, we are having some dreams and some facts regarding new tools. But we have to recognize that on the other hand, still there are a lot of colleagues, not only in, in, in the GPs that sometimes are you know, seen as those who don't have time, blah, 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 but also in the specialized field who do not recognize uh, obesity as a disease and continue to stigmatize both personally and clinically, I have something more important to, to, you know, to pursue and to just say, listen, if you do not do the things that are good to do, I stop treating you, okay? I listen to these things. So re really we have to, to, to close the gap uh, and, and probably the new tools will help us in doing this. Um, because then I agree that there is many things we can be done, blood, drink, and trap. But in the real life, in the everyday life, uh, it's very hard to, uh, you know, do the right uh, psychological, uh, take the right psychological steps, take the right lifestyle modification things. We really need something that help uh, uh, the patients. And I'm really confident that in the future, uh, uh, drugs and to a certain extent we cannot expect much more uh, reimbursement will arrive in some countries and then uh, we will talk about inequality because some countries may uh, might have reimbursement some other no but this discussion should go on um, thank you very much Lomo and those then I'll give you I'll give you now uh, the, the last uh, the last uh, um, a sentence to you, Susie. Uh, I think that is extremely important that our societies collaborate in this, this journey. So I think it's a very uh, well taken the idea to make uh, 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 for the World Obesity Day this, 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 joint, uh, uh, this joint meeting. And uh, Susie. Yeah, just something that's come to my mind. And this, I suppose, is the most difficult part of advocacy, but my job here is to represent patients and my job here is to highlight how bad stigma is and sometimes stigma isn't really recognized everywhere and I know we're trying hard to change our words um, and saying like diabetic patients is a really hard one to change when it's a terminology used for years and years but hopefully with obese people we change that that it's people with obesity people with diabetes it's a hard one to change and we're getting there but imagery sometimes can cut harder and I have to say Austin one or two of your slides will have to go because they 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 did offend me. And uh, so I am going to assume I can speak for others that they offended others. 
Um, it is hard and it's not intended. Stigma runs really, really deep. And that's why we're here to share how we feel about that and how that affects us and how that ultimately the worst part of it is how it affects us is that people don't then continue to get care. So I will continue to get care. I'm not offended that much, but just that we look beneath the layers and make sure we see stigma wherever it is. And thank you. Um, this is hard for me to bring up, but um, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. I think that we can close with your word and thank to all and see you soon. Uh, thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Online. Bye bye. Thank to everybody. You. Thanks, bye Lisa. Bye. Thanks, Lisa. Great organization as always. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.